in a um, in a somewhat um, long and varied uh, life, I have had the opportunity to provide many introductions for people who are going to speak. It has never been my privilege before to introduce a Baroness. And that is the uh, honor that I have uh, now. I'm very pleased to introduce Camilla Cavendish, Baroness Cavendish of Little Venice. Uh, is there a place called Big Venice that is an alternative to Little Venice? Is Venice, is, is Big Venice like the place in Italy and Little Venice is some place in Britain? Little Venice is some place in Britain. Um, Camilla did not inherit uh, the title of uh, Baroness. She was awarded uh, the title of uh, Baron Baroness, reflecting a remarkable sequence of uh, achievements as a journalist, as a, at the Financial Times, as a management consultant at uh, McKinsey, as an aide to the head of Pearson, as the head of various uh, non-profits, uh, and most relevantly, as the head of Prime Minister David Cameron's domestic uh, policy uh, unit. It was David Cameron's misfortune to have his term of office end sooner than he might have preferred, but it was the Kennedy School's uh, good fortune when uh, Camilla leaving uh, office chose to uh, affiliate uh, with uh, the most of our uh, Romani Center with which she has been affiliated for uh, the last uh, several years. She has published uh, one book uh, during that time on uh, our longer lifespans and longer periods of uh, retirement. And she is contemplating a next project that she is going to uh, discuss uh, with us uh, today. Welcome, Camilla Cavendish. Thank you very much, Larry. So let me first of all check, you can hear me? Can you hear me at the back? I always love that question, because of course if you can't hear at the back, you then put up your hand. Uh, so you can, great, okay. So I'm gonna um, talk for about 20 minutes, um, and then Larry and I are gonna have a conversation, um, and I'm gonna try and probe him on um, some of his responses to this. And then uh, we will open up to questions. We have, I know, a lot of people watching on Zoom online. Um, so we have a great team here who I hope will manage your questions if you're watching from afar. So I guess of all the things we thought were fixed about humanity, one was that our natural instinct was to go forth and multiply to ensure the survival of the species. And we're beginning to wonder if that notion was wrong. Because on pretty much every continent, more and more people are choosing to have fewer children or not to have children at all. And when I wrote my book, Extra Time, that Larry referred to, I was mainly focused on the aging of the world. But I did interview women in several countries about why they weren't having children. And there are a myriad of reasons. Um, Dr. Brinton, who's here from the Department of Sociology, knows a lot better than me some of those reasons. But collectively, those decisions are adding up to what the British economist Charles Goodhart has called the great demographic reversal. And when I was here as an MPA, is it not working? Focus on the no. Sorry, folks, on Zoom. You've just watched me. You've watched my lips move without any sound. Sorry. Is that better? When I was here as an MPA, you know, many, many years ago, um, I took the first classes in environmental economics. And 
I have been an environmental campaigner ever since, and I've been deeply, deeply worried, if I'm honest, about the growing population of the world. But I think we're going to talk today about the fact that that period may be coming to an end. And for the first time in history, because we have falling birth rates and aging populations, we have more people in the world over 65 than under five. And that is going to require us to rethink our healthcare, our jobs, our pensions, a lot of our assumptions about the economy, and potentially even our notion of family, because who are we going to rely on if we no longer have kids? So here are a couple of charts. Now, I'm going to show you that there are, there are quite a lot of countries that are already shrinking, and I apologize for the small size of this. Um, anybody guess? These are the five countries here that are already shrinking. Anybody want to guess what they are? Any suggestions? Italy? Japan? Yes. Korea? Yes. Very good. Two more. Actually, no. Spain, yes. And one more, that is the earliest, the one that actually at the bottom, the green at the bottom that started shrinking earlier than any other country, in fact. It's in Europe. It's Poland. And obviously, you know, one answer to that would be immigration. Um, I was at a private lunch in Tokyo a few years ago where an impassioned economist, Japanese economist, said to a politician, if we don't do something about immigration, our country is going to become extinct. And that politician said, yeah, I think you're probably right. Um, there are two countries I've just put here. These are going to peak. Um, the big one is Russia. Clearly, we in Europe are certainly thinking a lot about Russia at the moment. In fact, they sort of had one peak and now they're having another. The small one is Singapore. Um, here is the US in red and the UK in blue. Uh, the US projection is slightly off, actually. Um, what's been happening in the US, you can see that it is leveling off. Uh, but actually, since 2016, something really surprising has happened in the US, which is we have seen quite a substantial leveling off of population growth not mainly due to fertility, but due to immigration. And that is a different, you know, I'm sure you're all having other conversations about that in other rooms. And the last chart is China. Now, China is set to max out its population in 2030. And as you no doubt know, the Chinese Communist Party reversed its one-child policy about seven years ago. But most Chinese couples do not want more than one child. It's become a social norm, and that's something we will come back to. Now, one of the things about China is that the impact on the economy is clearly going to be substantial. And we've had what the Bank of England governor, Mervyn King, once called the nice years, non-inflationary with continuous expansion. And that was driven partly by Chinese workers moving in droves to Chinese cities and being incredibly productive. Now, we have something that looks very different. Um, those of you who study this will be used to seeing population pyramids. This is Japan on the left. If you laid out in 1950, the population with each age group represented by a bar, the youngest at the bottom and the oldest at the top, um, it looked like a pyramid. And that was the pattern throughout most of history. If you look in the middle by 2015, it looks a bit more like a barrel with a quarter of the population over 65. And between now and 2050, uh, we're looking more like a flower pot with longer lifespans really beginning to alter the shape of the pyramid. Um, this is China, the equivalent for China, and that's the equivalent for the US. Now, let's just look at the overall picture for a moment. Um, there are now three respected forecasts for global population, and within each one you can see, of course, there is a range of different scenarios. But what is really interesting is the Wittgenstein Center's population is now suggesting that total global population could peak at 2055. Now, obviously, a lot of the variances are driven by the assumptions we make about sub-Saharan Africa. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa is the, grow the fastest growing part of the planet. Um, but it is really striking now how different these estimates are. And I think we're in a new territory for demographers who are really no longer sure quite where the planet is going. And if you, if you look at the central forecast, we can sort of ask ourselves, what's it going to feel like for somebody who's born today who's going to have to adapt in their 30s to a planet which might be <coughs> shrinking rather than growing? Um, 
this is a chart from India just to show you that the trend crosses all faiths. I mean, Catholic Italy, as we pointed out earlier, is already shrinking. Um, and it crosses all continents. India, really, really interestingly, didn't have a one-child policy, but is following a very similar trend. And women are, on the whole, tending to have their first child at an older age. The left-hand chart shows you the peak for American women, the peak childbearing age has shifted from 25 to 29 to the 30 to 34 bracket. And actually in Europe, it's, it's, it's above that. And on the right, we can see uh, some new stuff from the UK, which is showing that effectively fewer women are having children at all. And we are now in the UK approaching levels of childlessness that we have not seen since the 1920s. And by the way, COVID hasn't improved anything. We haven't had a baby boom. We've had a baby bust, perhaps because seeing the same person day in, day out over the dinner table has not actually been great for all of this. Now, I wanted to put this up because there is a bit of ambiguity here. And this is a really interesting new paper from NBER. Um, you know, for a long time, if you look at the 1980 chart, um, rich countries with high numbers of women in the workforce had lower fertility. And poorer countries and more jobless women had higher fertility. And the conventional wisdom said, well, of course, it's really hard to hold down a job and be a mother. And I have three children, and I absolutely know how hard that is. Um, by, 20, by 2000, though, in some countries, that trend had started to reverse. And in the richest countries, some of the richest women were beginning to have children again or have more children. And one of the things that's interesting about this is that Norway has a very high rate of public subsidized childcare. So you think, of course, it's made it much easier. But the US does not, and it doesn't have paid maternity leave. I mean, to those of us in Europe, the US sometimes feels antediluvial on these things. But it too has been bucking the trend. And one of the things the authors of this paper are speculating is that it's possible that American men are beginning to step up to the plate and start to do the kind of household chores that Sheryl Sandberg wrote about in Lean In. Um, I was saying last night, one of the pieces of lean in that always struck me was she said, before, when you meet a new potential partner, you've got to have the conversation, are you going to share things 50-50? Not something that my generation ever did, I have to say. So here we are. Um, <laughs> governments, governments are really freaked out by this. Um, this is the most sanitized version of this campaign that I'm going to show here. Um, the Danish got very keen. The Polish also have been waging campaigns to encourage people to have more children. It has not worked. Uh, women particularly have kind of been completely deaf and quite resentful, to be honest, at the tone of some of these campaigns. Um, and actually, although governments have been trying to bribe people into having more children, often with subsidized childcare, again, that hasn't quite worked. Now, maybe it's because they haven't spent enough money. So if you look on the left hand chart here, you can see that it has it is costing more to have a child. And the biggest change in this chart is education. Um, if you look at the right hand chart, it seems like parents today are spending more and more time with their beloved children. The one thing I can't explain, by the way, is France. I don't know whether this is a mistake or whether the French have somehow brilliantly managed to delegate their children. But um, the, on the rest of the trend. Is, is fairly clear. You know, we are investing more in our children. Uh, we feel we need to spend more time with them. And in that sense, it, child rearing is becoming more of a burden. But here's the thing. What if the choice to not have a child is not just financial? What if it's something else? This is the latest data from Pew. And it says increasing numbers of Americans of age under 50 say they're unlikely to have kids. That's a really substantial increase, as you can see, in just the last few years. Now, obviously, that's been a pandemic period, so there may be an effect there. But a big majority of those who say they're unlikely to ever have children are saying it's because they just don't want them. And I think a lot of the work, the behavioral work around social norms is potentially relevant here because it does suggest people are echoing each other. It's become quite acceptable, quite possible not to have children, which is great and very empowering for many people. Now, this is the kind of card, greetings card, you get in every card shop, right? I mean, we're still seeing this stuff. 
Um, there's a lot of articles are written about, oh, you know, women, they're, they're putting their work ahead, of, their career ahead of children. They, they didn't think about their biological clock. I've met very few women who didn't think about their biological clock. Um, but I have met a lot of women who are actually very unsure as to how to balance a career versus children. They're not actually sure they need to have children to be fulfilled. And in fact, women I've talked to in Singapore, for example, really talk, and couples in Singapore, talk about the cost benefit analysis of having a child. Now, I had three, I didn't do the cost benefit. If I had, <laughs> maybe things would have been different. But it is an interesting way to look at it. And the word lifestyle comes up increasingly often. That doesn't mean it's easy. I think it is very, very, I think it's increasingly difficult, difficult for women, especially highly educated women, frankly, to know what to do. But if you think about it, for centuries, people had children because they needed them to go to war, or they needed them to till the fields, or they had a god who told them to go forth and multiply. And those things very rarely apply today. And if you think that kids are a lifestyle choice, then it's very much about whether you think they're going to be fulfilling. And a lot of people do find they are fulfilled by having only one, or possibly only two. Now, let's talk a little bit about the economic implications. Clearly, the first part is that the rate of growth of the working population is set to decline. Now, um, just ignore the brick line here because it's a, a little bit confusing. But China's working age population peaked back in 2014. Uh, Europe's in about 2010. You can see that India has an advantage and so does the US. And these may be slightly exaggerated because it assumes that every adult stops working at 65. And in, in my work, I have argued that adults should work a lot longer than that and are capable of working a lot longer than that. But nevertheless, this is an important chart because it suggests the geopolitical shift that is going to take place between these different parts of the world. And far from working longer, certainly in many parts of Europe, as you can see, a lot of us are not even working to retirement age. It's quite an interesting distinction between um, some of the Nordic countries on the right and some of the others on the left. Um, actually, the more pensions you pay to people, surprisingly enough, the, the less they work. Um, that's a whole debate going on in Europe, but it's very, very difficult to break a contract that you've made for a lifetime with someone who's already 60. So, one way to improve the situation, obviously, would be to raise immigration. But we are in a period of political backlash against that. And second generation immigrants often adopt the norm of the country they move to. So even though the US is still growing with the immigration, and that's the assumption, eventually the curve is going to go down. Or we could try and raise productivity of each worker. Japan has invested heavily in robots. Um, you can see exoskeletons in car factories. There's a whole lot of things we can talk about. But the truth is that productivity is going to have to work really hard to offset demography. And, you know, maybe the old are not as dynamic as the young. And maybe people in Mumbai, people in Lagos, people in Nairobi, where I just was the other day, are going to want to stay there because they're really exciting cities and they're going to become the centers of innovation. Um, Quickly, just to say, obviously, if we get sicker as we get older, it's not going to look good. This is something I do a lot of work on uh, in the UK. Um, and obviously, as the dependency ratio rises, household savings start to fall. So all these baby boomers who've been putting aside for their retirement, they start to consume health and care. And Larry, I hope, will comment on you know, what that might mean for interest rates going forward. But here is a picture some of you may recognize. If you are lucky enough to have parents to negotiate with, um, and I, I'm just getting into that uh, age group with my own children, I recently met the chairman of a British building society who is making a lot of, I mean, he's agreeing to, with parents, that they're going to give their children deposits to get apartments, to get homes. And he told a story about a guy who'd just come in to see him in desperation. He said, all I want to do when I get home from work is have a cold beer out of the fridge. And my daughter's boyfriends had drunk all the cold beer every night. <laughs> and I just want to buy them a flat to get rid of them. Um, so, you know, the bank of mum and dad is not always altruistic. And one of the problems of the bank of mum and dad is it may be spending too much money on you. And it may not have enough money uh, for itself when the time comes. Um, interestingly, the bank of mum and dad is also responding to the fact that 
adulthood is coming later and later and later, partly because students are so saddled with debt, as many of you know, people are living at home longer, but it is really striking what's going on in the Mediterranean countries. Um, we find 47% of women in Italy and 58% of men are still at home in the 25 to 34 age group. Men stay at home a lot longer than women, and the women I've spoken to don't react too well to that either because they don't want to move in with the mother-in-law and, you know, things are getting very complicated. But if the old, as we saw earlier, are not that keen on working longer, there is some suggestion that the young are not too keen either. Um, I'm not sure how true, true any of this is, but in Japan, there's talk of the Shinjirui, a new race. I probably haven't pronounced that correctly. Um, in China, there are people talking about the new generation lying flat because people are just feeling, you know, our generation has been cut out of things. And maybe it's demoralizing if older people don't get out of the way. You know, we might want older people to work longer, but if they don't get out of the way, how are younger people going to rise up the organization? How are they going to get the jobs in a shrinking world? that is going to become a serious challenge. Now, one of the things we're seeing is more people opting to have one child. As I said, this goes way beyond China. Um, and actually in China, the vast majority of working women in cities are still having children, unlike Europe, but they're having one. And there's a huge question. I am an only child, so I'm resentful of suggestions that only children may be selfish, entitled, and so on but it is possible. It's also possible that their parents might be less willing to send them to war. And that in itself may have implications. But what China has had to confront is what's called the 4-2-1 problem. This is a cartoon from the China Daily. Um, you know, the only child is having to support a lot of people. And China passed an elderly rights law 10 years ago to try and force children to go and travel sometimes hundreds of miles to look after their aging parents. But the split is acute. And that leads to another question. Are we heading into a lonelier world? Um, we're seeing more multi-generational households with students coming back and living with families. But the overall trend is towards people living alone. Um, and in Japan, we're seeing a steady increase in kodokushi, people dying alone. And that is one of the things we have to worry about in an aging society. So before I conclude, I want to end on one uplifting note, uh, because I realize I've begun to sound a bit like Elon Musk in this presentation. Um, maybe what we need to do is change our notion of family. Maybe we're going to have to look after each other in different ways. And actually, we're already seeing blended families. We're already seeing all sorts of different things that are not the nuclear family model. And just to tell one story, this picture was taken in Okinawa in Japan which I studied for my book. It's where people live longer and more healthily than anywhere else on the planet. And they have a moai. From the age of five, they are given a group of friends who are friends for life and they are a support group for life. And they're not related to those people. So I think maybe we have to start searching for those things in our own societies, different kinds of social support networks. So to finish, back to where I started, I think the demographic reversal that is coming is huge and profound. I don't think we yet know exactly what the implications are, but I think it's very important that we start to address it in our very, very short termist politics. This is not something that we often think about, and we have to make sure that we are not alone in doing that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Camilla. That was uh, that was terrific. I said I would talk a little bit about uh, some of the more narrowly economic aspects as they relate to uh, the secular stagnation <laughs> ideas that I was putting forward uh, for some number of years. I'm not sure they're the most fundamental uh, aspect of uh, all of this. I think it would be interesting to look at global figures for non-poverty populations. That is, if you take what's going to happen to the world, leaving aside people in very poor countries, 
I suspect you're going to get a peak of population much earlier than 2064, and that the magnitude of the decline you're going to see by 2100 is quite striking, and that the relative fraction of the world's population that lives in countries that are now rich versus that lives in countries that are now poor is likely to change quite substantially. And that if you calculate the average income of people on earth, as we go from a world where Africa is one sixth of the world's population to a world where it's one half of the world's population, that's not gonna likely to do good for uh, that uh, average uh, ratio. What about the economic uh, implications of uh, slower population uh, growth, leaving aside uh, the issues about uh, immigration? I think the first thing to say, and it's slightly different from something you imply, uh, you implied is that what we probably care largely about is per capita standards of living. And so if the population grows slower and productivity is the same as it is before, that's kind of the same as we were uh, before. The GDP of countries will be lower um, and will grow less rapidly, but the standards of living of their people will have grown the same. There's a question which I leave to philosophers of how we feel about the people who might have had a chance to exist but don't have a chance uh, to exist because somebody decided to have one kid rather than two kids. But in most economic senses, you probably want to think about uh, standards of uh, living. There are likely to be, it seems to me, two large-scale macro-type effects that would bear on economic uh, well-being. One is that as population grows slower and people and average ages are older, unless a lot happens to retirement, the dependency ratio will go up. And so fewer people will have to support more people. You'll go from 70% of the population working or 60% of the population working to 50% of the population working. And that means that people will be poorer. That's not completely obvious. It depends on what happens to retirement ages. And it also uh, neglects the fact that children are dependent too. But for plausible magnitudes, it's likely that aging societies will be societies where a smaller fraction of the people at any point in time will be working. There is an offset to that, which is that a society naturally out of its total output has to both finance consumption and it has to finance capital investment so that there's housing for the people and so that there's uh, equipment for workers who are entering the labor force. And that's not consumption. And so if the question is what's going to happen to the amount of consumption that a society can support, it is not so obvious that it is going down just because the fraction of the population that is aging is uh, going up. David Cutler, Jim Paterba, and I, paper 30 years ago, that argued that based on the magnitudes of that second, uh, of that time, the second effect was actually larger than uh, the first effect. And so it might be less burdensome than uh, one would have uh, supposed. There's then the set of effects having to do with what happens to 
savings desires, investment desires, and uh, therefore to equilibrium uh, interest rates. Here I find myself in disagreement with your British colleague, Charles Goodhart. My view has been that slower population growth will mean substantially less investment because you don't need new houses, you don't need uh, new equipment, that the aging population in principle will mean more dissavers relative to savers. So it will also mean lower savings. But in fact, people don't dissave that much as uh, they uh, get older as an empirical uh, matter. And if people are gonna have longer retirement ages, they know they're gonna have to save more than they're, when they're young. And so you get increased savings. So my view has been that in general, the tendency here is probably towards an increase in savings relative to, uh, int relative to, uh, lower uh, relative to investment. And so it points towards lower equilibrium interest rates, less demand, more likelihood of Keynesian problems. Charles has the opposite uh, view. I'm, my reading of the evidence is that I'm right, but I'm not <laughs> highly, but I'm not highly confident uh, that, uh, that is the case. Those are, I think, uh, the larger macroeconomic in uh, the classic macroeconomic effect uh, type. There are two other more speculative, but I think potentially more important uh, effects. One is about the nature of technological change and you referred to that, in a world where labor is more scarce, perhaps innovation will be more devoted to conserving on labor. And so perhaps in a labor scarce uh, world, you will have better innovation and therefore more rapid productivity growth. There is a major line of thought in American economic history that holds that America developed more, more and better manufacturing techniques in the 19th century because we had more land and therefore the opportunity cost of getting somebody to be a manufacturing worker was higher and therefore there was a higher wage. So in effect, there was a labor shortage in manufacturing and that drove better innovation in America and drove us towards economic supremacy. Um, my impression is that about half the economic historians who think about this believe what I just said, mm -hmm. and about half of <laughs> believe that that's wrong. And I, part of this firm would, uh, was kind of a financial type, uh, type firm. So it, it was quantitatively oriented. So there was, so, you know, if I walked in there today, I'd be the oldest person there by 15 or 20, uh, 15 or 20, 15 or 20 years. But it encountered the following kind of issue. People would come when they were 24 or so and they'd be working for people who were 32. And they'd think that was fine. People who've been 32 have been working there for eight years. And it's kind of the natural order of things that the 24 year olds work for 32 year olds. And it was fine. After eight years or so, 
it would kind of happen that lots of the 32 year olds would actually decide they were smarter than the 40 year olds they had been working for and it would sort of make them unhappy. When the firm was growing, everybody kind of stayed happy because yes, I was still working for the 40 year old and I might've thought I was smarter than the 40 year old, but I had four 24 year olds working for me. So life was kind of good and everybody was kind of happy because they were seeing new opportunity and they were seeing uh, new growth. When for reasons having to do with the firm's competitive positioning, it stopped growing in the way that it had, all of a sudden there started being a lot more friction because it wasn't really possible for people to see growth uh, in their jobs in quite the same way without there being other people who had to uh, make way. I have a suspicion that uh, this is a potentially fair-sized issue for societies <laughs> as labor forces uh, shrink and all of that. And I think the dynamics of effective organizations and the macro dynamics of effective societies may point towards retirement ages at somewhat different stages. Now, I should confess that I have the same feeling that I once heard Bob Solo express 30 years ago today. When I heard him say it, I thought I'll be more mature and reasonable than that, but I was wrong. He was probably in his 60s at the time, and he said, you know, it's interesting. My judgment at the age at which people are smartest and wisest goes up by about four years every five years <laughs> as I have aged, and I confess that I have a much higher opinion of the relative ability to contribute of 67-year-olds today than I did 35 years ago, and a higher opinion of the capacity of 80-year-olds to contribute today than I did 35 years ago. And I try to ask myself, am I right now or was I right uh, then? And my guess is that some old, and one possibility of course is that is the theme of your last book, that we've all gotten much healthier and smarter and aging is different than it was. So I was right then and I'm right now. <laughs> That is one logical possibility. My suspicion is that uh, truth lies somewhere uh, in between and uh, that I was probably a bit excessively in a hurry for people to make way for the rising generation then and that I'm a little too reluctant uh, in uh, my attitudes uh, Day. But I think this broad question of uh, making way um, and how it affects the pattern of uh, work and uh, retirement uh, is an extremely important question. And more broadly, I must say I'm told, uh, Jason Furman tells me, I don't know whether it's true, that in the official United States calculation of the social cost of carbon, that a substantial majority of it is with respect to things that are projected to happen after 2100. And so if we are as a society going to be heavily engaged today with problems and issues that are going to be felt after 2100. And I'm not sure we should be. I think for the most part, if my great grandparents had worried less about me 
and enjoyed themselves more, it would have been morally better. So I'm not altogether sure just how much effort we should be devoting to thinking about 2122. But insofar as we are thinking about the condition of the world in 2122, the idea that everything will be shrinking, it seems to me should be getting vastly more attention on the relative list of problems than it is. And therefore, I think the effort in which you're engaged is a very, very valuable one. Thank you very much. Thanks, Larry. Um, yeah, well, you, you said an awful lot there. Um, I, I guess what you just talked about, which is referencing, you know, in more detail, what I said about making way is, I mean, economists have debated the lump of labor fallacy for a long time. Um, and it's, you know, the, the, the argument that it was a fallacy was always because of the assumption that things were growing and so there was always somewhere else you could get a job. And we, we haven't really seen this situation before where, as you say, where things are shrinking. Um, I mean, I do think we need to probably start rethinking hierarchies. Um, I've looked quite a lot at multi-generational workforces. There's quite a lot of research in Germany that older people and younger people can work together. There are enormous communication problems. I mean, people don't even know, you know, what kind of technology to use. They pick up a phone. They, I mean, it, they really are quite significant problems now between the generations in figuring each other out because we've got such massive um, elongated lives. But I do reflect, I talk to a lot of the kind of consulting firms that probably many of you may go off to after this, the kind of accounting firms. I mean, they all have privately retirement ages of 60. They are all actually pushing all of their partners out at 60, um, even if those are the highest earning partners. And initially, I thought, well, that's an outrage. I mean, why are we pushing out people who have still got plenty of energy in the world? But, but you know, the point you make, you make, Larry, is is probably what these firms are also very aware of. They have some of the brightest and best people in the world, and they also want to get their chance. But it may be that we have become too obsessed with hierarchy and ladders, and everybody's obsessed with climbing up. And if we are living longer, we are going to have to accept that we can't go on asking for seniority forever just because we're older, and we also can't require a bigger paycheck because we're older. So I think those of us who are getting older have to think more creatively about how do we move to one side? How do we still add value? But we don't keep, as you say, keep the, um, the younger people down. I'm, I made up the term uh, a while ago, parabolic career, to refer to the kind of idea you're expressing, that we're going to work for a long time, mm. but the peak of what we earn and the peak of how much responsibility we have may right. be closer to the middle of our career uh, then uh, to the end to reflect exactly what you said. You talked about multi-generational hierarchies. I think one of the sociological sort of questions involves older people working for young people. Yeah. I've had a certain amount of exposure to this uh, in the context of law firms. And there's kind of an issue, which is that the 45-year-old Everybody's kind of happier if the 45-year-old who gets the client is having a 30-year-old associate helping or a 30-year-old young partner helping rather than a 62-year-old partner who doesn't have as many clients anymore because their connections have retired. The 62-year-old doesn't really want to work for the 45-year-old partner, and even if they did, it's not that comfortable for year old partner and so there's that kind of aspect as well yeah I mean when I was running I was CEO of a nonprofit when I was 26 and I had the most wonderful guy who was probably 45 and he got seconded to be my finance director and he was absolutely horrified but within about six months we had completely made it work actually um, but it did require both of us to, <laughs> to take a very very different position I mean it's interesting if you just reflect on big tech where the average age is, you know, incredibly low. And actually what's happened is because so many of the founders are incredibly young, they've tended to hire people younger than them and they've, they've shut a lot of older people out. And, and obviously a lot of older people don't have the tech savvy. But in a funny way, we, we've sort of lowered the bar too much there. So, I mean, maybe we're all going to have to be more adaptable. Or maybe we're going to have to hive older people off into some kind of BSO equivalent, you know, where we all go off and do good works. I mean, that, that's the other that's the other possibility. We are, enough time has passed that I think we should open this up uh, 
to the room. And I think that if you said, I think there's a system supposedly in place yeah. um, where uh, if people um, if people send uh, send messages into the Zoom, they will be emailed to me. But let's start with if there's any questions or comments in the room. I think that both of you were giving a much too dreary picture about this hierarchy notion and young people, old people working for young people. I'm probably the oldest person in the room and I didn't, couldn't quite follow what you were saying because I've, I've slipped quite a bit. Um, but um, there's, in the history, we know that small cohorts do better than large cohorts. And you didn't talk about the fact that there are going to be many fewer 24-year-olds or 32-year-olds who are going to be getting these positions. I see, if I look at the next two generations of my family, the thing they worry about is getting into college. And getting into, for example, Harvard these days is very, very, very hard. And I presume that if Camilla is correct in her projections, getting into Harvard 30 years from now is going to be hard but not very, very, very hard. It's gonna be easier to be the fancy pediatrician or the fancy geriatrician in Belmont. It's gonna be easier to open up your own restaurant and serve all those old people who are uh, dis-savings. And you didn't talk at all about the fact that not so many, there'll be many fewer people with a big demand to take on responsibilities in society. And it's not clear which way it goes. And that doesn't mean that in a law firm, we're not going to have this problem, but opportunities, for example, for entrepreneurship, as we've seen in all the high tech sectors, are going to go to the young and there aren't going to be many of them. Just to make sure I understand, I think the premise of, I think one of your examples actually probably wasn't quite right, which was the it's going to be hard to be a pediatrician. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> okay. But no. But no. But but I think the the premise, just to make sure, the premise of what you said is in any activity where basically the young serve the old, where the young produce for the old, there's going to be more opportunity. There's going to be more demand relative to supply, and it's going to get better to be young. That's the that's the it 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 depends on the activity having. The, if it's just an activity where the if it's if it's kind of I'm guessing you're not on Facebook very much. If it's um, an activity where the young serve the young, then. Uh, it's then your effect is not going to be present around the small cohort. So it 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 it's just clarifying what you said. It's not disagreeing with what you what you said. That what it depends on is that relative share. Um, just just one thought on this. Back to what you were saying, Larry, about technology and technology is obviously a key to productivity per capita. But one of the things that's really been difficult to automate so far is care. And, you know, if you go to Japan, you can see all sorts of caring robots. But the truth is that people want to be looked after by humans and robots don't have much EQ. And that is really difficult. So I, I never want to be bleak, Richard, as you know. But if we're what we don't want is a world where young people are basically dragooned into having to endlessly care for older people with dementia. I mean, that, that is that is the wrong outcome. Yes, in fact. Thank you so much for a very, very good presentation, Camilla and Larry. I think mostly my question is for you, Larry, but it's actually follow up on what you just said, Camilla, a second ago. Um, one thing that, that keeps me up at night is this political economy problem that actually it's real in a lot of European countries. I have a lot of countries that have pay-as-you-go systems, pensions. Uh, you have countries that have large um, elderly population that vote you have uh, the same countries, they have obviously smaller populations of young people, 
sometimes they vote even less, but either way, the, the core of the voting mass, it's actually in the elderly. Um, the elderly voters' pre preferences are not actually correlated with bringing more immigrants to, to bring up the labor force. Um, and, and what happens is there is a lot of pressure on all the political spectrum to increase the expenditures purely on, on pensions, and, and, and obviously that leads to less investment. Um, what would be a way out of this sort of bad equilibrium uh, that it's actually real, is not theoretical, and it is driven by this demographic dynamic uh, in, in a lot of countries? So I've been on some of these questions, I have at various points been on all sides at various points in my life. I used to be much more confident that having a lot more capital investment was good than I am today. Today, I notice how low real interest rates are over long periods of time. And that's got, seems to me to have something to do with the certainty equivalent marginal product of capital. And when those numbers are very, very low, I get more worried about whether what we really need is lots more capital investment. So I'm not 100% sure that having less capital investment is, uh, is quite as terrible as your question suggested. But I think that's not the main point of your question. I think the main point of your question, which is a lacuna in everything that Camilla and I said taken together, is that there is a political uh, dynamic, which is that as things as things age, um, decision, uh, decision making um, tends to shift towards those um, with uh, older ages, and those with old those with older ages um, tend to make decisions that don't favor the young, and that tends to reinforce a set of the dynamics. A place in which I observed this uh, was during my time as president of the university, I observed at least some tendency as mandatory retirement had been done away with for the average age of tenured faculty members to rise. And as that happened, the average age at which new tenured faculty members rose were hired tended to rise as well because people tended to like people 15 years younger than them, not 30 years younger than them. And it tended to create what seemed to me to be a potentially unhealthy, dyna unhealthy uh, dynamic. So I think that's a, I think that is a very uh, real kind of issue and I don't have a uh, great set of uh, uh, a great set of solutions uh, to uh, to suggest. I suppose that um, it is it's probably the case that this overlaps with a lot of political controversy. That if you do things to make it easier to vote, I think those things in the United States at least those things will tend to raise voting levels among 35 year olds more than they will tend to raise voting levels among 75 year olds because voting voting levels among 75 year olds start out much higher. Um, and so there's less room to adjust them. So it's another reason for uh, early voting, voting, making election day a holiday for uh, those kinds of uh, agendas. Why don't we take, we're getting near the end of time, why don't we take three or four questions and then we'll respond to them as a group. Yes. Uh, so my question is for Professor Summers, uh, tying this demographic uh, phenomenon to the future of the monetary system. Uh, so let's say that after this pent up inflation fight, uh, the Fed establishes its credibility so over over time, uh, will these demographic, uh, you know, headwinds 
force uh, central bank balance sheets to keep ballooning over a long period of time? And if so, uh, is that going to increase the demand for a new global monetary system? Not to use the B word, but a uh, rules-based, hard-coded uh, global monetary system. Mary? That's what's happening in Japan. Young people vote at a very low rate, even though it's very easy to vote because the country is run by old men and older, the older population has a very high voting rate and the younger generation feels cut out of the economy. And that's also influencing whether they want to have children or not. And they don't because they don't have good jobs and they don't have political power. So it's it's playing out in a kind of a death spiral in some societies already, I think. John? Um, I'm not gonna comment on the economic side of it, but there was a professor here at the Kennedy School a number of years ago. Uh, he wrote a book called Bowling Alone, Bob Putnam, right? And all of this, you know, what he talked about was the breakdown of the social dynamics and the things that tie people together and the breakdown of community. And it seems like that's a huge issue when you look at these demographics and you touched on it, Camilla, at the end when you talked about Okinawa and, and kind of the community there. And the question is really around policies that should be put in place to try to drive the building of community as some of these other social structures start to break down and who should make those investments, whether it's the government, whether it's how much do we expect from the private sector? Who has that role? Why don't I say a couple things and then give you the last, and, get, and then uh, give you the last uh, last words uh, if that uh, if that works, Camilla. Um, there are various interactions of various kinds, I suppose. But I think that, roughly speaking, demographic change and crypto are fairly orthogonal political issues. And I can make a case for various kinds of views about crypto, but I don't think that if I thought something different about demography, it would change very much at all any view I have about uh, crypto. I think the example on Japan is uh, interesting. I didn't know what you said, but it uh, doesn't it doesn't surprise me. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't surprise me at all how much that really bears on the decisions to have children, I think is, a, and whether people feel empowered and whether 30 year olds feel empowered in the political process, how that affects how much children they have. I'd be surprised if one can confidently know uh, about uh, I think a secure job is a different, I think is a different set of questions. I also think, I think there's a word we have not said here that is uh, really quite important, which is housing prices mm -hmm. and housing availability and amount of space and taste for urban life versus taste for suburban life. I think that is probably quite high order uh you know all of this and we we should acknowledge that i think if you were thinking about i suspect if you told me the president of the united states said to me the most important thing in my world in my life is that i want to do things that will raise the american fertility rate six years from now by three or four tenths of a percent um tell me stuff i can do um I think I'd probably spend a lot of time thinking about affordable uh, affordable housing and location of housing and all of that. John, I think your point about bowling alone is an, is an important one. There's, there's sort of, if families are gonna be smaller, then you need more role of community. There's, a, um, there's an aspect that Bob points up in his work, um, although he doesn't always emphasize it because it's sort of uncongenial, um, 
which is there is a well-documented tendency for um, similarity and feelings of commonness to be strongly associated with community and generosity and feelings of difference and diversity to be associated with less continuing empathy. And so while one might prefer it to be otherwise, one has to think about that aspect as one thinks about uh, the role of immigration uh, with uh, respect uh, to uh, all of this. Camilla. Great. Um, gosh, thank you for some great questions. Um, I think, I mean, Mary, it's really interesting what you said about Japan, and you're the expert on that. I, I do, there is clearly some evidence around the world that people who feel insecure, people who feel uncertain about the world, uh, people who are worried about climate change are genuinely thinking, do I want to bring a child into this world? And that, that is clearly part of what is going on, which is an extremely responsible attitude, actually. But, but that is clearly, and that may be something to do with the chart I showed, which suggests that richer people are starting to buck the trend. But the fact that poorer people are having fewer children does not mean that women are being empowered. I think it's really important to understand that. I mean, in one sense, we can see this as an empowerment story, that people are able to have careers and they're able to make choices. But I think that's not necessarily the whole truth. And that's something I want to get, try and get to in this project. Um, John, yeah, your point about bowling alone is absolutely right. I mean, I have very little faith in governments to produce these sort of outcomes through policy. Um, certainly when I wrote my book, the kind of stories that I gained from around the world of people spontaneously coming together to redefine age, to bring the generations together, these were all done by individuals or by nonprofits or by people on the ground. And I actually think it's very inspiring. I and mean, I think that's the kind of thing that, that um, the Kennedy School does very well, is, is trying to look at you know, grassroots organizations, how what things can happen. But we do need to look at those and then think what policy frameworks might we put in place to, to encourage them. But there are clear, it's clear that social trust, there's some work in Italy, really interesting work about social trust. And since the financial crash, I mean, let's not forget, the financial crash looms large in some of this. Um, places in Italy that had greater social trust did tend to have uh, more kids. Um, but nevertheless, the overall trend is, 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 is down. Um, but I guess I would just say thank you very, very much. We, I mean, a lot of these things are questions to which I certainly don't know the answer yet. Um, maybe there isn't an answer, but um, a lot of this is going to help us as we move forward in this project. So thank you.